Hi and welcome to Catholic Unscripted episode 18. I'm Catherine Bennett. I'm Mark Lambert. I'm Gavin Ashenden. And because we haven't quite managed to get an episode out each week, we're, we're running it every two weeks at the moment. A lot of things have uh, built up for us to discuss and pick apart. Uh, we want to try this evening to talk about what's happening with the US bishops, um, the Latin mass, um, the fact that the Church of England have uh, said that they are going to, they voted in favour of blessings for same-sex couples. We've got the SNP leader, Nicola Sturgeon, and the uh, furore around her uh, trans row, gender identification, stepping down, and then Kate Forbes, who has been criticised for her Christian views, who's going for the leadership there. And we also have um, this story about sex education being taught in the Isle of Man with uh, drag queens coming to visit 11 year olds, telling them about 73 genders. So there's a lot to pick through. We will do our best and whatever we don't cover, we hope to try and discuss uh, at another time. But we'll start then, Mark, with the US bishops. So um, we have Bishop Paprocki, who's given a response to Cardinal McElroy about his interview in America magazine, where he was talking about radical inclusion and so on. And we go, and actually that leads us into talking about the, the things going on with the Latin mass. So Mark, what can you tell us about that? I think it's really interesting. So it's a real break from cover. You, you know, you've got this habit of all the bishops, I think, have got this thing about unity, you know, that they kind of like to pr uh, present a united front, irrespective of whatever's going on. Sometimes you get a whisper of what's going on behind the scenes. Um, but this is a real, this letter, this essay that Paprocki has printed in First Things, really is, a, is like breaking cover. And he's been very explicit about this. And I think it's really important to talk about what how it built up because what you've got is you've got um, so it's like it, from an English point of view it's it's a bit like the Bishop of Clifton being promoted above the Archbishop of Westminster to be a cardinal yeah it's just wouldn't that it just wouldn't happen you've got your sees that are cardinalates you know that get promoted to cardinal so if you're going to be a cardinal you get promoted to that place and if you're good then you get promoted to be a cardinal yeah and that's like you know Suffolk sometimes or well Westminster in the UK and we've got McElroy was promoted above his um his archbishop basically which was Gomez who was the head of the US bishops conference is a Mexican I mean he ticks all the boxes for Francis in terms of you know he's not like we know that Francis hates the gringos you know being a South American he hates he's really got a thing against the gringos so, um, and, um, you know, Gomez would have allowed him to sort of sidestep that prejudice. But no, instead, he promoted this guy, McElroy. Now, McElroy's got, there's loads of dodgy stuff in his background. And um, the most thing that he came to my attention was uh, at the last US Bishops Conference, which was like four years before this one, um, he stood up and argued against the primacy of abortion in terms of uh, the pro-life strategy of the Bishops' Conference. And he was the only one who stood up and did that. And he was, you know, roundly criticised for that. And the bishops voted, you know, to make it a, a preeminent issue. So this is the sort of guy that we're talking about. You know, he's, he's part of this. We've talked before on here about the seamless garment, Bernadine and all this. He's very much part of this scene. And uh, so, and Francis making him a, a cardinal, surely what can it be except a hat tip to his theology? which is a massive contrast to everything else that the Bishops Conference in, in America stands for. You know, the vast majority of the bishops in, in America are going in one direction, theologically, and this guy is standing up against it. So as soon as he gets the red hat, what does he do? He starts going on about radical inclusion, LGBT inclusion, uh, dropping the uh, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven, which has always been part of the catechism, you know, that you can't go to Holy Communion in, in a state of mortal sin. And he starts cracking on about this. He does a series, of, like he did a podcast and he did a, which I posted on my blog, and uh, he wrote an essay in America magazine. Now, loads of bishops have come out. And so basically, Barron, you know, we came out twice about it. He's written two essays on Word on Fire. Uh, Bishop Aquila wrote about it as well. Nauman and Conley, and Paprocki has written about it before, but they did it in a very, um, you know, ambiguous sort of reaffirming doctrine sort of way. 
And what the break is with this essay that Paprocki is basically, he's all but called Sue Pitcher and, and McElroy heretic, you know. Like, he hasn't named them, but he has directly quoted McElroy. <laughs> so it's fairly obvious who he's talking about. And then the title of the piece is Imagine a, a Heretic Cardinal. And the repercussions for all of us are massive. I mean, you know, in, according to canon law, if you're, a, if you're a heretic, you can't be a cardinal and you can't vote in the conclave. But, you know, I mean, if they are <laughs> manifestly heretics and they are, in the, you know, potentially in the next conclave. So what happens from here? I mean, it's like breaking cover and now all the bishops are, are openly at war. And another interesting dimension is that this is synodality, isn't it? This is why synodality was dropped, you know, <laughs> a few hundred years ago by the church, because it ends up to with bishops having a punch up in the in the synod hall. You know, once you've got, uh, let's have an open discussion about all these heretical ideas. It opens the door for anything, and you you know it just doesn't work because you've got to have the whole point of having a pope of being Catholic is that you've got the deposit of faith and the Pope is the one who secures that deposit of faith and teaches it, you know, in a new way, always ever new for each modern age, but it's the same faith. So massively interesting developments. And of course, that means that challenging McElroy openly like this. So first of all, I think the bishops, the US bishops must have had a conflab from the way that um, Paprocki talks about it. You know, he says like, it's time to, stop having private conversations and to have public conversations he, you know the bearing them bearing in mind that he is the guy in charge of church governance for the u.s bishops and canon law he's a canon lawyer and a civil lawyer and he's basically come out and, and quoted canon law and said you know we just can't have this and this is a guy that francis has directly appointed obviously so surely it's a it's, it's you know it's the u.s bishops coming out against francis isn't it how else are we supposed to read it? Gavin. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was waiting. I thought Catherine would say Gavin, but Mark, I'll take it from you too. Hang on. Gavin. <laughs> right. <laughs> that was very good. Thank you, Mark. So the same Paprocki has involved himself in the Latin Mass skirmish. Um, Mark has his title. He's the, he's a chairman elect for which committee, Mark? Uh, it's oh, hang on a sec, just let me. It's, it's uh, caught me on the up bit there. So he is uh, the the bishops' committee on canonical affairs and church governance. So he's a fairly serious player in America, and one of the things he's done uh, is he's, he's basically playing a form of of um, political chess with um, uh, with Roach. Uh, and uh, the, the the dilemma for the for people sympathetic to the Latin Mass is that, that obedience is required and disobedience is dishonouring. So Paprocki, as a canon lawyer, has met Cardinal Roach's rescript by saying, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the designation of one of the churches where the Latin Mass takes place and is treasured, and I'm going to change it from being a parish church. Now, it's true, you have to have more than one building in a parish to do that, but nonetheless, it's an inventive, obedient uh, and creative riposte to what's going on, the, to, to the movements that Roach is making. And it sets an example to, to bishops throughout the world, saying, if you want to, with a bit of effort and energy and imagination and pastoral care, you can protect the Latin Mass with the implication that it should be protected. Um, so that's, that's really rather exciting and dramatic. And as Mark says, um, he can't have done it by himself. There's quite there's clear indications that the bishops have been talking behind the scenes a lot. But with that, uh, yesterday or today, the Catholic Herald, merely Catholic podcast came out and I talked to Joseph Shaw, who's a very interesting man. And very briefly, I think there's just a couple of things I want to, to suggest. And the first is that Joseph Shaw says things have been much worse for the Latin mass during his lifetime. He's not at all downhearted. He thinks they're hugely better than they've been ever been before. Uh, and the interesting thing is he has absolutely no idea why this new policy has come, because he says he doesn't believe it comes directly from Francis. Only a few years ago, Francis was actually uh, giving some encouragement to the Latin Mass. He thinks it's most unlikely that he's simply changed his mind. He also thinks that Roach may simply also be trying to be 
a good bureaucrat. He, he's not entirely sure that Roach is quite as uh, malignant as some of his critics have suggested. And he thinks this is more a matter of chaos theory. This hasn't been organized in a deliberate attempt to quash traditionalists, but it's in the situation maybe a bit darker than, than Joseph Shaw's rosy interpretation. But it's very interesting to listen to him. Uh, it takes quite a lot of the paranoia and the steam out of it. But also he's immensely hopeful. One of the things he said, uh, which was was uh, not recorded, but nonetheless, if I report it in a in a slightly more fuzzy form, perhaps it can be said, is that news is coming out of Rome that that um, dear George Pell was immensely busy in the, the years, the, the times he spent when he died and coming out of prison, and one of the things he was doing was making it his business to do what Pope Francis hasn't done. And that is to contact all the new cardinals that Francis has appointed, to talk to them, to pass to them, to get to know them, to discuss things with them, and above all, to help them come to some greater clarity that whatever happens, we can't have a successor to the present Pope in Francis's own image. Now, uh, I think this probably might be true. It would be just what I'd expect, the very sensible Pell to do. He was very quiet. He was working hard behind the scenes. But it's entirely possible that if this is true, then the next conclave may not be quite as threatening and dangerous to the church as we are slightly afraid that it might be. It's really interesting, especially because I think I've mentioned before that, I, you know, when I had a chat with Pell, that was, uh, I, I, you know, at that stage, uh, you could see that the cracks were appearing and that there was going to be a real problem with Francis. And he was very much like, oh, you know, don't worry, leave that to me, you know, I'll sort it out. And of course, it was a complete, I often think back on that conversation and think, did he ever think, oh, blimey, you know, <laughs> it was, you know, perhaps there was a bit more to that than, than met the eye. Um, and we've got this attitude as Catholics, which is a good thing, I think, you know, that all in good time and everything will be, you know, everything is in God's hands and it'll all work out. But it's like the, the concern, like, I hate using conservative and liberal, but let's say the orthodox and progressive wings the orthodox wings welcoming the progressive what was i saying i was saying so i was saying about Pell and the fact that he you know he seemed to um be yeah we, and so as catholics we seem to be very relaxed about the future sometimes and think you know but um when the progressives get in they just seem to just, just i mean he's we've had 10 years of utter destruction it's been going on from the minute he got in to the office and the fact that he's you know like i look back to benedict and jp2 promoting liberals and you know for because they wanted this dialogue and they you know all the things that francis says he wants francis gets rid of all the orthodox people and just puts in all liberals and it's you know i've just had enough of it frankly i've had enough of the the pseudo intellectualism <laughs> you know of the the synod I don't know if you saw i'd love it if we could put up that meme that uh did you see that Matthew Hazel put on Twitter today with Conan the Barbarian? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, is the, what is the aim of synodality? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to crush your enemies and <laughs> hear the lamentation of their women. <laughs> oh, it's, yeah, like, <laughs> it's very good. But we must never lose hope. No. Oh, no, no, absolutely not. No. no, and I don't. I'm not in any way, shape, or form losing hope. I think you can be cross with the idiots who are in charge, and that's one of the the things. One of the key things about this papacy, I think, is that you know that old adage I was thinking the other day about. Um, you know, when I ran my own business, I always used to think I want to be the, the the dumbest person in the room. Do you know what I mean, Gavin? Like you, you want to surround yourself <laughs> by geniuses. You know. Do you know what he well, means, Gavin? I, I, I have never, ever wanted to be the dumbest person in the room, but then I never ran my own business. I can see the difference. I can see why you want, you would want to surround yourself by, by the cleverest possible people. people who are, yeah, people who know more about stuff than you. And, sure. you know, it seems like Francis is determined to just promote yes men or, I mean, we see it in Roche. Roche is someone who was, you know, I mean, this is widely, it's not, um, it's common knowledge. It's not hidden knowledge. That he got he got a Leeds diocese into five million pounds worth of debt or five billion pounds worth of debt, and uh, basically they kicked into Rome, you know, to go and work in the dicastery, 
to get rid of him because he was such a disaster. And and since, like, basically, you know, Cardinal Sarah, who was brilliant, was in mm. charge of it, mm. and Roche was just a secretary or an undersecretary. But since Francis come in, he's obviously been busy making himself, you know, at, do whatever the Pope wants, making himself a yes man. And that, and he's, that's seen him float through the ranks. And we see that time and time again. And we see that Pope Francis, um, um, you know, raises these people to high office and then drops them just as quickly, you know, because... They've not done what he wants, or he's fallen out of them. I mean, it's just such a mess. As as a priest of my acquaintance regularly says to me, what a mess. You, you've you talked about uh, Pope Francis' intellect. You think he's not capable, you've said before, of grasping some of the, at, at the same level as some of his predecessors, like Pope Benedict XVI, that part of it is just an inability. This is something Ed Faser exposes. He He's recently written about Pope Francis' um uh, responses about the death penalty and he it's absolutely brilliantly done edward faser have you read that have, he's he shows what pope francis is saying and then goes through the implications of what he's saying and how they, so, they're just not compatible with the, the you could say the same about uh, traditionis custodius couldn't you where like basically why is this the third or fourth attempt to clarify what's been said when the first thing came out none of it made any sense you know, Article 2 in Traditionis Custodis explicitly says that the bishops are in charge of liturgy in their own diocese, which is what Gavin was saying about Pabrocchi. And now they've brought out a rescript that says that they aren't, that everything has to go through the Holy See. I mean, you're talking about, this is a, a motu proprio, which has said that you're not allowed to advertise mass in your parish <laughs> bulletin. I mean, you couldn't make it up. Are we, what, are we talking about intellectual giants here? These people are lunatics. <laughs> and on that note, I'll go. <laughs> I'll go back to to Gavin's hopeful um, message about Cardinal Pell and his uh, discussions with various cardinals before the next conclave. Um, to but then to move on to the Church of England. Back to you, Gavin. The Church of England has recently voted in favour of blessings for same-sex unions. Now you wrote about this for the Herald, and then Gascon have uh, responded. It hasn't gone down too well. Gafcon have said, we in Gafcon call on the leaders in the Church of England to repent and return to the teaching and practice of Holy Scripture. Um, what's happened here and what are the implications? Well, I think the most important thing about this is, is that it's a, a danger signal for the Snowdal way and the Snowdal path. Effectively, um, by, by treating the culture wars uh, synodically, what the Church of England has done is to give way to the, the zeitgeist, and um, uh, so they 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 haven't been able to change the doctrine of marriage because they haven't got enough people to do it. It requires a two thirds majority in all three houses. They can't quite get it, so they've effectively changed pastoral practice, and all the time saying, "But we haven't changed doctrine, so no one needs to leave." Um, the, the the south, the global south, as it's called, which is mainly Anglican Christians outside Europe, for which there are a great many in Africa. I've been watching this for 20, 25 years, knowing perfectly well what the outcome is in the same way that we know perfectly well what the Germans would like the outcome of the Snowden way to be. Uh, and I've said, here's a red line. If you do this, we're going to uh, distinguish ourselves from you and basically sack the Archbishop of Canterbury from being the chairman of the whole Anglican global movement. So in the, they're in the middle of doing that. Uh, the liberals and the progressives are half delighted because they get to endorse blessings of gay couples but they're a bit cross that they haven't got gay marriage uh, so everyone's just been left a bit cross the conservatives are cross but it's gone so far the liberals are cross hasn't gone far enough they're in the middle of schism this really does not seem to be a work of the holy spirit well i think it was a, it was brilliantly illustrated by um I, I saw a little snippet um of justin welby meeting a couple of uh, <laughs> gay men did you see that Gavin? yeah and i did it, I so they were like, yeah so, and they were like, oh, I don't feel safe. If it was a black person, you would, you know, <laughs> you wouldn't get away with it and all this sort of thing. And so, and this is the problem. And Welby goes, oh, yeah, that's really bad. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> it was, Mark, it was, it was worse than that. It was, it was the, the kind of standard that you get in a third rate technical college when a third rate principal comes down to talk to third rate pupils about the fact they haven't done their homework or they don't like the course and so these, these gay activists outside Lambeth Palace so first of all when we came down we're wearing a sort of 
duffel coat and some ridiculous hat looking looking completely idiotic which is not good for an archbishop and then they then then these gay activists gave a whole load of uncorroborated hate speech saying do you know do you know i think it's almost like in a dozen churches they eat babies for, for communion i mean it was they 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 want to burn or i think they literally said they want to burn or drown gay people something mm. so outrageous and well be said oh no Tell me about it. Give me the details. I'll act on it. And in fact, tragically and stupidly, uh, uh, he did act on it. There was a, a rather sweet uh, Anglo-Catholic activist called Sam Margrave. And, and days after Welby met these these <laughs> these paranoid and um, hyperbolic activists, he and the Archbishop of York sent, well, sent Sam Margrave a hate letter saying, oh, yeah. "You, we think you're one of the people who's been who wants to drown gay people or be horrible <laughs> to gays and 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 we censor you now they've never censored anybody in the whole history of anglicanism not 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 since the the, the burning of catholics and the hanging drawing and quartering in the 17th century of the archbishop censored anybody but they censored Sam margaret on in order to placate these these these, these hysterical hyperbolic inaccurate and 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 uh i don't the words you can't i try not to be too impolite these people, I mean, and it was so immature. It, it was so, it was such poor quality. You thought, how is it possible that, that that an archbishop could have a meeting like of this quality with these people in public and re retain any vestige of respectability? It, it, it was just badly done. And really the, what, what the Anglican Church has done must act as a warning to the Catholic Church that if you go down that path, there be dragons. It's chaos. It doesn't look good down there. It's absolutely got nothing to do with the church, with holiness, with the gospels, with the Holy Spirit, with sanctity, with with anything at all. So let it be a let it be a dire warning. Mm, well said. And it's like the the anthropology was just so messed up from both sides. You know, like the the argument that the activists brought was rubbish and inconsistent and incoherent. And, the, and Welby had nothing to come back with. You know, he just capitulated straight away. It's like, do you not understand the stuff that you stand for? That's what that's what this whole thing has made me so sad about. And I've listened to some brilliant um, YouTube videos from uh, evangelicals, you know, who are really sort of passionate about following the church's teachings. And, and what they're doing is they're saying, look, we welcome all people. You know, we're all made in the image and likeness of Christ. And, and you, if you are gay, you're welcome in our church and we love you and we value you. But marriage is between a man and a woman because marriage is about procreation. This is what the Christian church has always taught. And I think they're doing it. They're having that conversation really, really well. What's, what, what upsets me is the fact that they're in a minority and they're almost trying to pretend that they're not in a minority going. Do you agree? And that, I think that's some sh synodal shenanigans where there has to be a, 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 a large majority or something like that. But if there's a, if there's a large minority, then the, the, the thing shouldn't be, the proposal shouldn't be passed. And so they're sort of trying to pretend that there's more of them. I mean, if you look at the voting, all three houses voted for the thing and it's not, they haven't, they're not saying they're going to bless gay marriage or, you know, there's lots of rubbish being written about it. What they're, what the proposal is, like you say, it's, a, it's neither Arthur nor Martha, is it? It's like, you know, we can bless people, uh, sort of, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like... Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's really interesting. And ex Gavin has nailed it completely by saying that this is... That fundamentally, this just... If you feed these monsters, they just... Will, they mm -hmm. will eat you. You know, there is no way out of this. If you go down the progressive, if we don't stand on what we believe, yeah. and if our bishops can't stand up for, for, for Christian teaching, then, you know, what's the point of them being there? Step aside and let someone who actually believes in it stand up and, and teach it. Yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head when you said a different anthropology. Um, Peter Crave talks about how in conversation with a, a gay man, he said, well, you Christians are always saying, um, we love you. You're welcome. You can come to our church, but we don't think that you should be having gay sex. And then he said, how would you feel if we said, well, we love you, Christians, but we hate your churches. We hate your liturgy. We hate your icons. And Peter Crave said, yeah, sure. Actually, that would be hurtful. I would find that very difficult. You're quite right. I've learned something. And then he said, but you see, the thing is, 
you've got two nouns, gay and Christian. And he said, there's only one absolute. So he said, which one do you want to hang on to? Do you want to have a gay lifestyle or do you want to have a Christian lifestyle? Because he says, the reason that I find it difficult when you say we hate your churches, we hate your liturgy, we hate your icon, we hate Holy Communion, is because that's my absolute. And he says, so what's your absolute? What do you want to die for? What is worth you know hanging on to and it and it's incompatible but we're not prepared to say these two things are incompatible and we can love you and we can welcome you but we can also condemn this lifestyle we're not prepared to say that well we are prepared to say that the catholic church does say that but we we find it uncomfortable saying it loudly in the culture and defending it yeah it's interesting and we're like it's like uh all any sexual act that's um not open to procreation is something that's condemned Ooh. by the catholic church so it just fits yeah. into that, you know, that's where it fits in. Exactly right. OK, SNP, back to Gavin again, who's written about this. So the Scottish National Party leader, Nicola Sturgeon, was she. So they passed a law, didn't they, to allow gender recognition to, to for self-ID and um then it caused a big roar, right? And she stepped down following that. And there's since there's we're now in the middle of a, a new leadership election and Kate Forbes is uh, one of the contenders. And then she was dragged through the mud this week or last week for having uh, said that she would not have voted in favour of gay marriage. And she's uh, pro-life and she's a Christian. And then people are saying, well, you're a Christian. You, you're then you spoke about this on GB News, didn't you, Gavin? And you wrote about it. So Nicola Sturgeon, SNP, Kate Forbes. Gavin. <laughs> I think there's three things that are worth noting about this. Um, the, the first is that the media did their very best to destroy Kate Forbes because she said, for myself, I don't believe in abortion. For myself, I believe in heterosexual marriage. Uh, but it turns out when they did some polling that actually really quite a lot of Scottish society liked the fact she had principles and respected her principles. So the huge furore that the media set up saying this is you know, the new witch hunt or the new saint hunt, as we called it, uh, didn't was not... Uh, did not reflect the average view of, of, of the constituency that Kate was trying to get votes from. That's the first thing. I think the second thing is there's always an assumption in the media that if Christians believe in heterosexual marriage, they're willing and wanting to force everybody else to do the same. It's a very subtle distinction between our saying we'd like a Christian society, we'd like to live in a society moral to long Christian virtue, because we think, we think, and there's plenty of evidence for it, that it's good for you. But we wouldn't dream of forcing anybody. We, we, in fact, we can't force people and we'd, we, we'd hate to. We want to convince people it's good for them. But the media won't allow this distinction between our saying we'd like you to, to experience this and, and we're going to force you to do it. Um, so that, so, I mean, Kate Forbes was saying, this is just for me. I'm not going to threaten anybody else's rights. So in a democratic liberal society, people can do what they like. And if I was prime minister, uh, chief minister, um, I would respect other people's choices. Brackets, but every Christian, of course, wants people to move closer towards the love of God. Close brackets, but it's implied. The third thing, which was very interesting, was that the huge uh, march of questioning, aggressive questioning, uh, and questions that all presumed uh, a bad answer, was directed at her. But none of it's ever been directed at Rishi Sunak, who's a Hindu. None of it's been directed at Khan, who's a Muslim mayor of London. None of it was directed at her Muslim competitor. Um, so Muslims and Hindus get a completely free ride. The media never asks them this question, although if they asked any faithful Muslim, they would get exactly the same answer. So once again, what we're really dealing with is, is, a, is a, a highly toxic, prejudiced and bigoted media. But the good news is it doesn't. the media doesn't reflect the views of people in the country on the whole. Uh, there are far more people. It's a bit like Elijah, uh, Elijah and... Uh, prophets of Baal there are in fact more people with us than we knew Sorry, I, I think that's why she left she got kicked out didn't you a lot I think it's the contro the controversy that finished her off Sturgeon oh yeah uh, yeah we don't we don't know I mean it might also have been her pet uh, her husband's finances which were uh unlikely my I, I've just been brought this by my son excuse me if I <laughs> oh, I, good. Didn't know Nick, I didn't know Nicola Sturgeon was married to, to a man she wants she oh absolutely her enemies called it a marriage of convenience but but she but she is and his finances are more than dodgy as will as will come out later in life, later on i thought it was i watched the bbc interview with uh 
Katie Forbes and um, the other fella, Hamza Yusuf. Yeah, Hamza and Yusuf, that's it. I thought it was, that's what really interested me. And it's the same as the gay thing, right? If you, like we had a conversation in the family the other day that it's like, um, if you, you know, the, the, the ONS survey that came out, it's like 0.2% of people in the country uh, uh, label themselves as queer or whatever. But if you watch the BBC, you'd think it was 202%, wouldn't you? You know, or listen to the BBC on the radio. And this was the same thing on BBC News, where they, you know, they've not mentioned really the, the uh, transgender, you know, the the rapist, the bloke who was, you know, I mean, I yeah. actually could have gone and said that that was okay for him to be a woman, you know, whatever, okay, whatever. Um, but this, so basically this interview was like, with um, Yusuf, the BBC interviewer was saying, oh, you're lovely. And uh, what do you think about this? Oh, yeah, we think that as well. And yeah, it's so, oh, brilliant. Everything's brilliant. And then they got Katie Forbes on and it was like, uh, Katie, you're a bigot, aren't you? <laughs> that was sort <laughs> yeah. of the approach. And the, like, the two things were just so stark. that, And it's just got to the point I find so frustrating where they're just so openly pushing a narrative now, aren't they? That there's no balance and I think they're blind to it, you know. I'm really yeah, there's no about... attempt. There's no attempt. No, who's asking Hamza Yousaf whether in his support for LGBT and trans rights, he would be very happy for a trans man to or a trans woman to go into the uh, women's washing area of a mosque and, and wash with other women and unveil? Would he be happy with that? Why don't they ask the same questions of him that they're asking of Kate Forbes if they're going to bring that into it? It's completely inconsistent and incoherent. And if we want, surely we want politicians to be honest about what they think and, you know, to bring that into their, I mean, that's what we want. It's admirable. Rather than this sort of weird thing where politicians are just trying to do whatever they think the majority of people want from them and they don't actually believe in any of it and they've got another agenda that they're not really telling you about. That's what I find just extraordinary. Uh, Thomas, Thomas Sowell. Oh, Sowell, that's it. Thomas, Thomas Sowell. Sowell uh, now I've forgotten my point. I've remembered his name, but forgotten my point. Yeah, so Thomas Sowell talks about the, the short-termism. So politicians are always so desperate for votes that they're prepared to sacrifice long-term solutions, you know, that, 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 that they know will be better. And so it's always this immediate... Um, and so they're going for those immediate short-term issues that they know will please and it and it's so disingenuous and so I think people would prefer somebody to say well actually I stand for this I'm not uh afraid to say it and this is this will take time and it's something that we're working towards but instead it's this empty you know nonsense yeah, totally. and it, 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 it leads into that whole thing about proper leadership doesn't it and um you know leading from the front and giving us a direction and something to be proud of as a nation yeah, you know, this is yeah. these are the ideals that we stand for. And we're not frightened to express them. And instead yeah. of that, we've got this constant attempt at platitude. And interestingly, that's the same thing as well-being cultural, isn't it, Gavin? You know, that's exactly the same playbook. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Talking from talking of uh, leading from the front, we'll move to uh, the Isle of Man, where they have suspended relationships and sex education after a drag queen was brought into the Queen Elizabeth II High School and performed in front of 11-year-olds, told them that there were 73 genders and told a boy to leave who said that there were only two and uh, because the feelings of the drag queen were hurt. And this was all brought in under um, the Relationships and Sex Education curriculum, which has now been suspended. So uh, this is clearly ludicrous and... I, I, I'm utterly stunned when I look at social media and see the amount of people who the amount of people that you might otherwise think were reasonable who don't seem to see anything wrong with large men in miniskirts and big balls gyrating in front of toddlers. Mm. I mean, what, what, what's going on here, Mark? Well, I've just got an absolutely no idea. <laughs> like, you know, like you say. You put a brilliant comment on Twitter today, though, when someone else asked that question. You said, well, it's because they're virtue signaling. You know, they're desperately, they want to be seen as, none None of us, we've said this before as well, haven't we? None of us want to be seen as bigots or nasty, hateful people when the culture is saying, well, if you disagree with this stuff, then you're hurting their feelings and, you know, all this sort of thing. 
So I suppose, I mean, I suppose, uh, there's no way I would ever send any of my children to anything like that or have anything to do with it. But I suppose they're trying to be progressive and, you know, um, trendy and I don't know. <laughs> The problem is, you say you'd never send your kid to anything like that. But the the worrying thing is when we were talking earlier, weren't we, Mark, about parental rights? And this mm-hmm. idea has eroded this idea that the, the parent is first educator. And uh, schools seem to think there was something going around Twitter last week of an American teacher saying, I've got a master's degree. Good Lord, a master's mm-hmm. degree, you say. Well, you must ha- you must have more say over my children's education than I have. And we really have this sense that we outsource education to schools. Parents absolve themselves of responsibility. Mothers and fathers are both working. And then we don't even know what's in the schools a lot of the time. Uh, so you say, I'd never let my child observe that. But when you, ha- ha- we don't always know. That's the problem, what, co- what goes on in schools. And I know only too well that schools might present to the outside one way. And then when the doors are closed, their children experience something else. It's really, really dangerous. Mm. One of the interesting things about this, I think, is that <clears throat> many of us have been saying, can say, I told you so. So about 30 years ago, Peter Tatchell, who's a man actually I quite admire, I think he's very brave and very principled and very wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one of the things that Peter was famous for was saying there should be no age of consent between, between homosexuals and children. Uh, and the children had agency to agree to homosexual in, uh, intimacy. And, and people got very cross with this and he began to withdraw it, but it's all over the internet and it's been documented. And so many of us thought that it was really quite likely that after the feminist revolution and gay marriage, the next the next stop would be the sexualization of children. And I remember when I when I mentioned this, people looked at me as I was sick and, and, mm. and, and how could I possibly imagine or have that thought? Um, and so here it is with with through the drag artists. Again, it's difficult to know if it's a kind of spontaneous perversion or whether it's being driven uh, philosophically and strategically but one of the things that's happened in the Isle of Man is the parents have stood up and have said we're, we're not having any more of this and the government uh, have been presented with the evidence of the sexualization of children through the gyrating of these men in miniskirts uh, <laughs> as you so with all the rest of the, the description that Catherine so poetically added to it um, and and the government have been profoundly embarrassed and suspended all sex education Actually, they get their curriculum from Scotland. So what they were doing was already been, is, is already practiced in, in the Scottish education system. And I think, first of all, the next thing is, why aren't people astonished and revolted? And, and the answer is because we've been so sexualized through the culture that sex, the sexualization of our culture is so far advanced that many people simply see it as a kind of form of background music and, 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 and of quite incredibly accepted the idea that you don't need to defend pre-adolescent children from this, which is five, ten years ago would have been unbelievable, but that's the state of our culture at the moment. That's the frightening thing, is how quickly this has happened. If you just look back, as you say, five, ten years, even two years perhaps, um, you, you, if you said what was happening now, you'd be shocked. And we've talked before about telos. I think a lot of the problem is that since we've lost this idea of God, since we've lost this idea of objective truth, we don't have this understanding of uh, our human nature having a purpose, then we create our own. And I think a lot of people say um, they want to raise their children with the ultimate values of diversity, inclusivity and equity. But they don't think beyond that. And that's what you, you were saying on Twitter today, Mark. I was saying that what does the end of that look like? Because if you take that to its logical conclusion, it's no surprise that you've got drag artists performing in front of children. That's just the start of it. Because where does that end? If your ultimate value is to be diverse, to include everyone and equity and not God or any objective truth, then it's not obvious where that stops. And so so what's your value? It's really interesting because it's funny how these conversations often sort of follow what's been going on in my life over the you know the, the preceding time but you're in a safe um, place mark come on yeah. i can't see i can't see you in a musical mark i can't no no, no, no. <laughs> don't worry you won't ever have to worry about that one again. <laughs> um no um i had a chat with, with my son this week and we were talking about um the way that people who have divorced themselves from god or you know no, and it's not a, a an ardent atheism but rather that sort of laxation 
uh, that takes place. And then they're, they're in a they're sort of 20 something. They've not got anything except for work. Mm -hmm. And they're desperately trying to fill their lives with some sort of meaning to invent some sort of meaning. And, uh, they're, and they're kind of, you know, like we, we were talking about some people that we know and how this is very obviously what the problem is, you know, and, and I think, so I think you're right. And this becomes a kind of uh, religious following, doesn't it? And mm. that diversity and inclusion, yeah. it's all tied up with being nice. And, and it's become a real problem because we can't see the actual existential damage that we're doing, both mm. to our culture, but more importantly, to our, to our children. You know, I just, yeah. it's, it's absolutely shocking. And I think it was some, like that, it really interested me, Gavin, you tweeted David Aronovich's article in the Times, you know, and he's sort of saying that um, this is all a right wing confection, isn't he? And that, you know, don't worry about the drag queens. I mean, if you see those images, how can you not worry about it? How could any right thinking person think that this was anything other than obvious grooming? You know, it's grooming, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, absolutely is, of course. Although, uh, like you, Gavin, I, I sort of respect Aronovich and Tatchell because at least they're consistent with what they say. What's more problematic is when people say, I'm Catholic, I'm Christian, I'm Muslim, and then uh, have, you know, call, say that they support this sort of thing. I think that's far more problematic because at least, at least there's an honesty to saying, well, this is what I'm about. It's far harder going right back to the beginning when we talked about the US bishops, when you have this um obfuscation and and everything's undermined um anyway i think we've probably got to the end of our list what do you reckon yeah i'd like to say just one thing that emerges from this and that is the consequence of having no moral boundaries uh, and no sense of what is too far for for the expression of our sexuality uh, are really quite severe and uh, they they spill over particularly in, in in terms of the whole trans debate there are a good many teenage girls who, who dread becoming teenage girls. They dread the onset of their sexuality because of what they're going to have to experience at the hands of boys who've been watching um, heavy and, and unpleasant porn. And so without any boundaries, um, we, we, we've actually created, uh, we've taken gender dysphoria, which affected tragically 0.0.1% of the population. And we've imposed it upon a whole generation of schoolgirls who see it as a way out um, taking finding some kind of refuge from what's going to be imposed on them because the adult the adults who should have been guardians of their well-being as they entered into puberty and beyond it have um have abrogated all responsibility in terms of thinking about moral lines and how we use them to protect children as they grow up so these this decision this lack of decision making this lack of taking any responsibility this lack of clarity about how we handle uh, sexuality, which is one of the most powerful forces we know, uh, is, that is the price is being paid by our children. Well, uh, oh, sorry. Right. Well, I, <laughs> I mean, I could. I, 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 you know, that's exactly it, isn't it? And it's about that the fact that um, parents have abdicated their responsibility. They're leaving it up to teachers to, you know, they sort of feel that teachers should be uh, the ones who are professionals, are bringing up their children and even disciplining their children. And this is the sort of situation we've, we've found ourselves in. And we need, as a church, I'm, I'm sure we've said this before as well, uh, to be empowering. You know, uh, that's what Christian church should be doing, I think, Catholic church, especially, has so much opportunity with all the tools um, at hand at the moment to empower parents and to give them the information, you know, what we should be talking. And the other thing, Gavin, like about that and is that, We've stopped teaching boys to be proud of being, you know, of being a boy, and we've stopped girls of being proud of being a girl, and that's why you've got this, um, you know, horrible stuff going on where they they hate their own bodies and they think that solve resolving their feelings instead of sort of making, them, you know, making them recognise the beauty and the difference. And it's one of the beautiful things about the Catholic faith, I think, is that um, you know, fantastic equality and diversity. Yeah, it's absolutely awful what's happening to young men. Uh, that it's an international problem that they are um, dropping out of university, that they're attaining lower grades than girls at school, and they are. Um, I've spoken about this before. They're going to their bedrooms, they're watching porn, they're playing video games, and 
we don't know how to respond to it. And the way it's, the things that we reach for are the very things that are causing the problem. And because we're not able to say what a boy is. So it goes back to purpose. What is a boy? A boy is not a girl. The same, you're not going to find the same solutions for raising a boy as you are for raising a girl. And yes, there's overlap, just like there's overlap between me and a hedgehog and a dog in that we breathe and we copulate and whatever. But then there's a difference. They get, you, get, you get high enough where you get to a difference. And then you say, okay, what is it that marks a human out from an animal, a male out from a female? And then you focus on that and you try and help young men to become men. But if you can't say what the difference is, because you've lost all sense of purpose that we're created for a purpose, we're created differently for a purpose, which we have lost, then it's no surprise that boys don't know what it means to be a boy. And it doesn't matter anyway, because you can be a girl and a girl can be a boy and give it a few years, you can be a dog. And this explains the phenomenon of Jordan Peterson, I think, which is has a good aspect and a, and a sad aspect to it. The good aspect is that Peterson has stood up in the arena and, bring, and made a call to young men to be responsible, to be brave, um, to, to be proud of who they are and to develop themselves with courage and effectively offered a mixture of both the Stoic and the, and the Christ, Christian historic virtues. But what's sad about it is, it's, it, is it, it took an agnostic psychologist to do it, whereas this is a message that, that church should have been giving all the time and and it's it's all so often the case when the church fails god will use other people outside the church as as vehicles of what he intends for us so peterson is both a salvific figure for us and at the same time a rebuke absolutely yeah and of course we know that the perfect model for a man the perfect role model is christ uh, of, of how to be a man so you're quite right but yes it's good to call call young men to that responsibility because of course women need strong men and they need men to be men we need that we don't want to say that but we do and so it doesn't just uh disempower and emasculate men but it then impacts on women um right where are we we'll leave it there Brilliant. Uh, yeah that's it isn't it yeah that's everything oh that was quite a long list we did long tonight well done everyone good stuff Good work. Excellent. Okay. Well, I'm very grateful to you two for speaking out and writing about these things, because although we say, you know, in time, things will tip the other way. In the meantime, there are real souls, real young people whose lives are going to be damaged by this. So uh, I think it's brilliant. Thank you. Right. That's it. See you next time. I'm Catherine Bennett. I'm Mark Lambert. And I'm Gavin Ashenden. Good night. God bless. <laughs>